The Lord be with you. It's usually not fair to have to follow the choir, but it's really not fair to have to follow Sierra. Good job. That was awesome. Thank you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 is what we'll be reading this morning. Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, help us to hear what you would have us to hear. To see, Lord, what you would have us to see. And to answer that call. The call to do, Lord, what you call us to do. And be the people you call us to be. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. There's a good chance you've heard this passage before. Those of us in ministry have probably heard it so many times we can, well, recite it from memory. I know I've heard it dozens of times. I've heard it in chapel services and seminaries and college. I've heard it in classrooms. I've heard it in commissioning services for missionaries. I've heard it in the order of worship at services of ordination. Now, the dozens of times I've heard it, there's only one that really stands out. It was in March of 2008 when I was sitting in the sanctuary at Shades Crest Baptist Church on a Sunday afternoon. I don't remember much else about the order of the service for my ordination. But I remember the one who read this passage because it was Sally. She read this passage at my ordination. You hear it all the time in those services. It's the calling of Isaiah. At least the original Isaiah, the first Isaiah. The placement of the story is odd in, in the book. It doesn't come right at the beginning where you think it would, like most other prophets. And not only that, it's a bit unorthodox. The other Hebrew prophets that are called by God, their stories go a little different. Usually God calls them and they say, Huh? Or they say, no, no, it's not me, not me. And God has persisted until they reluctantly say, fine, I'll do it. But Isaiah is a little different. It comes five chapters later. And his is this vision. And this vision and Isaiah's response is what I think is a model for us. A model of a vocation response to God's call on all of our lives. Because the truth is, is the people of God, each and every one of us, is called by God to be proclaimers of God's good news, of God's good words to all of God's people. And sometimes that doesn't make sense. Because not all the time does the timing seem right. But the truth is, God calls us whether we think the time is right or not. 
I mean, have you ever tried to get the timing right for something? I'm sure you've probably heard, at least in the last week, the name Michael Curry. Yes, the uh, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. He's the one who gave the sermon at the royal wedding. Maybe you've heard about that. It was in the news a little bit. I heard uh, Michael Curry first when he was still the presiding bishop of North Carolina, although I can't remember if it was in Minneapolis or in Denver. Luke Powery, who was the dean of the chapel at Duke Divinity School, had introduced the, the Bishop Michael Curry, and it was like crickets in the sanctuary. I didn't know what he looked like. I was looking around for a guy with a purple shirt and a cross around his neck. Didn't see anyone. And after about 60 seconds maybe, which for a preacher is a long time to hear nothing, a man came in the side door with a backpack on, purple shirt, glasses, little salt in his hair. It was Bishop Curry. And he walked up to the podium and he said, Friends, when the Lord calls, you will tarry. But when nature calls, you will answer. <laughs> you can guess why he was late. But the truth is, is, sometimes the timing just never seems right. Well, no, I don't have my ducks in a row. I can't do this. Have you ever tried to wait for the perfect time to do anything? Has it ever come? Can you plan the perfect time for something? Going to plant a garden. The farmer's almanac says it's now. I can feel it in my bones. Granddaddy says it's now. And what happens? Rains all week long. You try to plan the perfect time. Going to buy a car. The old jalopy is had it. I'm tired of it. Going to go Saturday and trade it in. You wake up Saturday morning, walk into the kitchen, half inch of water all over the floor. The refrigerator died. Have you ever tried to plan the right time to do anything? No, there's never a right time. You can't wait on the perfect time. And in Isaiah's vision, if we hear anything, it's not the perfect time. And you can miss it. You can miss it because it's just there. It's just, it's just there as if we're supposed to know what's happening. In the year that King Uzziah died, you all know Uzziah, right? Went to school with him, maybe? No, nobody knows who Uzziah is. In the year King Uzziah died, do you know what happened? The year King Uzziah died. Isaiah's prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah. And before Uzziah died, there's relative peace between Judah and Israel. No real big threats on the horizon. Everything's fine. Everything's dandy. But in the year that Uzziah died, the dominoes start to fall. Tensions rise between Israel and Judah because on the horizon is the first great superpower of the ancient Near East, Assyria. In the year King Uzziah died means nothing to us, but to the people who read Isaiah's words for the first time. I remember that year. I remember that year. That's when it started. It's not a good time to call a prophet. God should have called him a few years before. Wait, maybe five years before Uzziah died. Let me know that he's coming. Let him know that this is about to happen. Call me then. Or maybe a few years after. After we've been through all the garbage. After we've been through all of this. After we know that Assyria is a threat. After all that. Then call the prophet when the people are aware of the danger. This is horrible timing. It's not good. But in this vision, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah has this image of God in the ways that only an ancient Near Eastern, ancient Near Eastern could express this vision of God. How do you describe transcendence? How do you describe God who is above all and beyond all and is all? How do you do it in 700 B.C.? He's big. He's so big, in fact, he doesn't fit in the temple. Isaiah has this image. He's standing at the threshold, not there, at the altar, at the door. He looks up. There's God high and lofty. He can't see Him. But just the hem of His robe fills the temple. The part His tailor sewed up so it wouldn't drag in the puddles fills the temple. God, Isaiah has this image of transcendence. Almost as if to say, it doesn't matter if the time is right. Because God is God whether the time is right or whether it's wrong. God is still God. And God still calls the prophet. So there may be times in our lives, whether they're personal, whether it's communal, national, global, whatever it is, times of great transition, of, of tumultuous change, of upheaval, times when we doubt ourselves, times when we doubt each other, times when we doubt God, but still, God is God holy and worthy of praise. 
That's what Isaiah sees. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that the king is dead. He still sees the king. And it's that same God, that unchanging, holy, unfathomable God, that calls us to share this divine presence, whether we think the time is right or not. And the truth is, God calls us whether we think we are right or not. Growing up, I was the best help my dad ever had because I was the only help my dad ever had. And I remember, some of you know, its secret is out, that I, I dabbled in being a mechanic for a while. But I can tell you the first time I ever did anything. I was 13, I think. I can't even remember what I was wearing, which is weird. It was like a peach-colored shirt I had cut the sleeves out of. Because, you know, when you start playing football, your muscles start getting big. you got to show them off. doesn't matter if they're white and the rest of your arm is, like, red. Um, but I was sitting in the living room. I was wearing that shirt. And I remember my dad, they drove a 78 Cut Cutlass Supreme ugly car, burgundy on the bottom, white vinyl top, what was left of it wasn't peeling from the sun, half the grill was missing, the intake manifold was leaking and dad had to fix it. And He was out there in the, in the packed dirt underneath the carport saying words I can't repeat at church. And my stepmom went out and she said, Paul, why don't you have Chris come out here and help you? He said, he wouldn't be interested in none of this. I didn't know a push rod from a piston. But I went out and just said, Dad, tell me what to do. Show me. I don't know, but you'll have to teach me. And I started learning from there. I was the only help he had, whether it was holding a light, holding a board when he cut it, whether it was lifting stuff because I could. But he called me whether I could do it or not to come help him. And God does the same for us. God doesn't wait for us to be ready. God doesn't wait for us to be right. In fact, God will call us even if we think we're right, which may be something we need to hear more than we know. It's interesting that when Isaiah is confronted with God's holiness, made all the more evident, not just because God's big, high, and lofty, that's not enough of an image. No, you've got to have these six-winged angels flying around him, covering their feet, their nakedness, covering their face, flying, singing, holy, holy, holy. You've got to have the place shaking. You've got to have smoke filling it. That's what you've got to have. That's to make sure the prophet knows, in case you forget, in case you were wondering, this is God. And in the presence of God, even in his vision, Isaiah is broken. Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. The prophet is moved to repentance, to the realization of his own inadequacy. And I think we can miss really the nuance of what that means. Because I think about times like at funerals or when someone dies and, and we usually quote that passage of Scripture though we're not always sure where it comes from. We say, oh, don't worry, every tear will be dried. I've thought about that a lot lately. Is that tear, are those tears of grief, of sadness? Maybe. But I think it may be more. Tears we shed in the realization that we stand in the light of a God who is holier than we can ever imagine and whose image falls incredibly short of who God is. Of the thought that we have of God, it falls incredibly short of what God is. Not a realization of our shortcomings of some divine expectation, but a realization that we were wrong when it comes to understanding who and what God truly is, what God does. And the fact that that same God calls us even still. Because it's easy to point and say, well, Isaiah's lips are purged. And then, no. It's the fact that even Isaiah recognizes that he is a man of unclean lips. That God calls anybody. God calls everybody in that moment. And the truth is that God calls us even still when no one else will answer. I think about that particularly on this Sunday before 
Memorial Day. It's a holiday, I think, that has gotten sort of uh, baptized in ugly waters at times. It's become sort of a civic religious holiday, a time to go to the beach or a time to save money on a mattress or something like that. But it's a holiday where we're supposed to remember those who have given their lives, those who have answered a call when no one else would or when few others would. I think about those kinds of things often now, about the things we're willing to raise our hands for and stand in line to do. But it seems like the things that are worth doing, the calls worth answering, those lines are incredibly short. Those hands are incredibly few. Isaiah, in his vision, is purged of his guilt by the seraph with the live coal. And as he stands at the threshold of the temple, he hears God. Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? He's not talking to Isaiah. It's as if God has, has gathered all the resumes, has, has looked all over, and there's no one willing, no one standing in line outside of the temple with their hands raised. Isaiah is not having to jump over the crowd to say, Here am I, Lord, send me over here. Look, the one jumping up and down. No, Isaiah could whisper it, and still it would be a shout. It's not a rhetorical question. It's as if God has said, the bucket is empty, and there's nothing here. And so Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. Words we'd hear, by the way, echoed from Matthew, on the lips of Mary, when the angel comes to visit her. Makes you wonder sometimes, did the angel go somewhere else first? And Mary said, well, no one else. Here am I. Here's Isaiah. Now here's the thing too. The passage ends here. But if we keep reading, we realize quickly that what Isaiah has volunteered for is not easy. And it is not nice. And it's not full of glory for himself. What he has answered the call to do is to speak on behalf of God to God's people. To tell them of the coming judgment and doom of Assyria. To tell them of their inadequacies, inadequacies and their ignorance and their injustices. To tell them that they have failed God in serving one another. And caring for even the widow and the poor and the orphan among them. It's not an easy call. But God gives it and Isaiah responds. I think sometimes we want the calling from God to be clear. We want it personalized. We want it to come in the mail with our name on the, on the envelope. We want a bolt of lightning, some elaborate vision. We want to be drying our hair in the morning and hear the lights go out and hear God's voice speak to us and say, I'm calling you now. We want it written on, in the sky. But so often God's call, perhaps most often, God's call is found when there is an absence in the midst of a need. That God's call comes when we have the gifts to meet that need and there's no one else in line. Even when it's difficult. Even when no one else will. Even when the timing doesn't seem right. God's calling is not just for those of us who stand in pulpits or pack our families up and move into third world country. It's for all of us who call on the name of Christ. God calls us all where we are. And I want you to hear me say that, that the things that you do in your life, it is not somehow separate from what God has called you to do. Because I believe every time you make someone's life a little bit better, you are answering the call of God. Every time... You nudge someone a little closer on that path towards holiness, towards happiness, towards joy. You are answering the call of God. Every time you can be a presence in the midst of chaos for someone who doesn't have that presence, you are answering the call of God. Every time you stand where no one else will, you are answering the call of God. 
And God still calls us. Right where we are, with all the gifts we have and even with all the gifts we lack, Right here, right now. Whether we think we're worthy, whether we think we're right, whether we think we're wrong, whether we think the time is right or not, God calls us. And here's the thing. Even when we keep our hands at our side, even when we whistle in the wind, and when someone else says, Here am I, Lord, send me, the call still comes to us to serve those in our lives every day. To recognize that there is no calling that's higher than another one. That you and I, we are all called right where we're at. Not as uninvolved bystanders, but as God's prophets. Mediating the holy, unfathomable presence of God to all of those around us. Not in the grandiose ways that seem to make the news. Maybe in those small ways where we've made someone's life just a little bit better. God's calling us. The holy, indescribable God calls us even now. Will we respond like the prophet? And we will continue to respond and say, here we are, Lord. Send us. Let's pray. Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like Isaiah in his vision, Lord, we know, God, we know that some, most often the time isn't right. We know, Lord, that we fall short, that we're probably, or most definitely, Lord, not fit enough for all that you would have us to do. But God, you call us anyway. You love us, you call us. And Lord, now you wait for us to respond. Help us, God, to see that in everything we do in our lives, in the small ways that we make things better, that we bring your kingdom a little bit more into this world, God, that we are answering your call. And help us, God, to do that more and more every day and to name it for what it is, your work, your calling, your kingdom. So call us even now, holy God, and help us, help us to stand in and respond, even when others may not. We pray in Christ's name, amen.